So you've always already talked about computers, but I'm sure you were thinking, I do most things on the mobile. How do forensic investigators investigate that? So let's talk about mobile devices. So there are a lot of different types of mobile devices. Previously, kind of 2G was the main cellular network. And this is what caused phones to be able to be small handheld. And uh, um, because they were digital, the new networks opened the door for practical data communications. And the beginning was referred to as feature phones. So this is sort of where having phones that could access the internet and such sort of began. A cellular system is a network of relatively short distance transceivers that are spaced strategically so that low power transmitters can reach the phones in their coverage areas and the very low power uh, transmitters in the cell phones can reach the cell towers. So we're essentially bouncing from one thing to another. The architectural functionality that distinguishes 2G from 3G, which I know by your standards is still pretty old, is that 2G systems were circuit switched, while 3G systems are pack switched, which is why they were able to be faster. The advent of pack switch mobile phone networks, that 3G, allowed virtually any kind of data to be accessed by a mobile device, and thus the true smartphone was born with the advent of 3G. Before that, they were, I guess, still technically kind of smartphones, but not true smartphones. Which brings us to what most of us are all on right now, which is native IP, also known as 4G networks. And these differ technologically from 3G networks in that they can access the internet directly. This increases speed and bandwidth dramatically. The most popular operating systems for mobile devices, in, including smartphones and tablets, are Apple iOS, Google Android, and the Microsoft Windows Phone. Now, I know you guys are, are mo mainly Apple users out there, but Android and Microsoft are still doing their best. Android for life. So 3G and 4G phones, yes, people out there still have 3G phones, are close in architecture and design to a PC or a Mac. So they are pretty similar to being a handheld computer. These phones behave the same way, especially 4G devices, and have the ability to download and install applications, which all, I know all the cool kids call apps, the same as you could download something onto a PC or Mac. One interesting aspect of mobile devices um, in forensics is geolocation. Um, the GPS in a mobile device can locate the user's activities and when used with a timeline, can place the user in the vicinity of a crime. There have been plenty of instances where people have denied being anywhere near the crime. They've gotten access to their mobile phone's GPS data and have been able to show that they were in fact where that crime was taking place. This makes it super easy to track the user's movements. Um, and most of you probably have your GPS location software turned on all the time. Each mobile device does have its own quirks. Um, each device needs special connectors and special device drives on the tools used to examine in order to decipher what is stored on the device. So while most computers are pretty similar to each other as far as how you would analyze them, when it comes to analyzing mobile devices, they have to have a lot more tools at their disposal because you would not analyze your iPhone the same way you would um, analyze my Galaxy. Storage in a modern smartphone or tablet is accomplished by an onboard non-volatile memory and mini SD cards. Many of you probably have an additional SD card in your phone for additional memory. All mobile devices um, should be kept in a Faraday bag or box. Um, essentially, Faraday bags or boxes prevent any signals getting out of the device and prevent any signals from getting to the device. Storing the device in this manner prevents um, changes from being made remotely from the device, so preventing someone from remotely shutting off their phone or remotely making changes to their phone. Physical forensic images are bit-by-bit -bit copies of the file system, including deleted data. And logical extraction is a snapshot of the file system showing what the file system wants the user to see. Mobile device forensic analysis can provide an overlay to the physical evidence and timelines as well as computer forensic timelines to give a clear picture of the events preceding 
and following a crime. So we, a lot of people have their lives on their phones, so we can see what has happened based on what they were doing on their phone. Examiners make it a practice to run the forensic image twice, taking one of the images and treating it as evidence. So that way, if you uh, mess something up, alter it in some way, you still have another copy that you have not done anything to. This is a great practice and avoids your evidence being thrown out of court. The examiner should decide based on what can be done with the particular device, whether to obtain a physical or logical extraction or both. So as far as mobile phone architecture is concerned, you have the SD, which stands for Secure Digital Cards, um, that are for storage expansion um, that many mobile devices have. I know I have one. The SD card adds memory for storing things such as photos or music. Sometimes you can even store apps on them and other things. SD cards are considered non-volatile because things are essentially permanently stored there. You also have a SIM card, which SIM stands for Subscriber Identification Module. And they have an International Mobile Subscriber Identity, IMSI, number that associates the phone with the subscriber's mobile network. Each SIM is an Integrated Circuit Card Identifier, ICCID. The ICCID contains the issuer identification number, INN, the individual account identification, and a check digit. So this is kind of like what we were talking about before with the IP address. It's different, but it's all of these numerical ways of identifying a device. In addition to memory, the typical mobile devices contains a digital signal processor, a microprocessor, a radio frequency transmitter receiver, audio components, and a power supply. The power supply provides the power to run the device and delivers the ability to charge the battery. So accessing, assessing the impact of digital evidence of an investigation. So on our devices, there are temporal chains which show events in the order in which they occurred. So that is one type of chain of evidence. The second type of chain of evidence are casual chains of evidence, um, which describe the event of a crime in terms of cause and effect. The links in the chain are the pieces of evidence and they are tied together based on how one link affects one or more other links. You can also do a hybrid crime assessment, and this is the technique that investigators can use when faced with a physical crime, such as murder, rape, or robbery, which has a digital element to it, a computer, a smartphone, some other mobile device. In our society, a lot of crimes are going to require a hybrid crime assessment because mobile devices are so incredibly common. So the object of a hybrid crime assessment is to tie all of these elements together. Keep in mind, we forensic computer and mobile investigation isn't being used in isolation. They are working with all of those other types of evidence we've learned about and will continue to learn about. The amount of information that they can get from mobile devices varies greatly depending on the specific device. For example, I'm sure you've heard of something called burner phones. These are relatively simple phones that you don't have to attach your name to. They can be that you pay for them and you just use them for one specific purpose and when they run out of minutes they're done. That's going to be a lot harder to track than your personal device that you carry with you all day, every day. So how, what they do with the mobile forensics really depends on the type of phone and how it has been used. All right, that's all I got for mobile forensics.